Kalaba. It's very good to see you on this Saturday morning. And so let's begin with a prayer. Dear loving God, we thank you for all the ways you're at work in our lives for good. Sometimes we see them, sometimes we don't. But we trust in you, and we trust in Christ. And we pray now that your Holy Spirit will be with us all morning, working through, through us, through my speaking, teaching, through the scriptures, through these lessons, in the mind and heart of each student, so that this will be a, a fruitful time, a fruitful time of learning and studying for us all. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. All right, now let's turn to our material for this morning. For the next four weeks, or five weeks, we're going to focus on the Apostle Paul. And as I said at the end of the last lecture, or it's in the lecture notes, the Apostle Paul gives us the most developed theology in the New Testament. Now we have many writers in the New Testament, of course, but we don't have a developed theology from those writers in the same way that we have it from Paul. And so I had to make a decision as a teacher and as a theologian to put Paul in the primary spot as we teach New Testament theology. He's not the only writer, but he's, he's going to be the, the primary or the first or the center place writer for us uh, because of how he's developed his theology and because of the extensive uh, amount of writing that he's done and how much he's influenced the church, especially Protestants and Baptists. And so Paul has a very important place historically for us, uh, but also uh, in, the, in the Bible itself. But you know, we've been talking a lot about context, and we will continue to talk about context. And so we're going to talk about Paul a little bit in his context, but vis-a-vis, -vis, that's Latin for face-to-face, -face, or, or in face of your context. So we're always going to be thinking, I mean, I want you to be thinking about you, who you are, what is your context, who is Paul and what is his context, and what's the relationship between your context and his context, his thoughts and your thoughts, okay, his theology, your theology. There's this dialogue going on. Now, since he's in the Bible, he informs us. We don't inform him. But yet... You and I are the ones that receive his words. We're the ones that have our own relationship with God. And so your views and your beliefs are very important too. And so there's this dialogue that's going to be taking place in this semester. So we're going to talk about context for a moment. And you see that Myanmar is way over here, right, in Asia. And where is... Where did Paul write his writings? Where was Jesus? He, yeah, sorry, you have to point. I'll point for you. It's way up here. All right. So it's the Middle East. And here we have Israel, and the, the little tiny Israel, and all the Arab countries surrounding them. Uh, then we have what's called Asia Minor, and Greece and Italy. So now and then we move into Europe. Sometimes people say, well, Christianity is a Western religion. Well, it's more accurate to say that it's been extensively developed in the West. But it really comes from the Middle East. Christianity is a Middle Eastern religion. It's interesting, the Middle East is a blend of Asia and Europe, East and West, North and South. And it's interesting to me that that's where Ju Judaism and Christianity and Islam began and flourished. And then eventually spread throughout the whole world. Alright, so how much has Christianity spread throughout the world? Well, that's a hard question to answer. But in Myanmar, Christians are about 6.2%, right, of the country. And what percentage are, are Buddhists? 
89%. All right. Have you, have you read the demographical information about your country? All right. You need to know about your country. You're no longer in the village. You're now in Yangon and you're preparing to be leaders, national leaders, with a global awareness. I believe that's your calling if you're a student here. All right. So that's why I'm giving you a glo global ma map. I couldn't put the whole globe on, sorry. This is as much as I could get on in one slide. But this covers a lot, Asia, Africa, and Europe. A part of what I want you to see, too, is that your mindset as Christians in this country is likely a mindset of a, a minority, right? Because you are a minority, 6% versus 89%. And so you might think of yourself as, as Christianity is a minority religion. And so if we look at the population figures, I don't know if you study this in other classes that you have, but right now with 31% of the country is Christian, 24% of the world, I mean, 24% Muslim, 15% Hindu, Buddhists are 6.9%. Okay, so you see it's, the global situation is quite different than the, the religious situation in Myanmar. And so again, I, I, I share this with you for a couple different reasons. One is I want you to, to begin to think more globally, but also to understand how you, your faith, what we're teaching here has been tremendously significant and influential throughout the entire world. This is not just the, the belief of a few Europeans or a few Americans. This is a, a faith that began in the Middle East and has spread to every continent on the globe, including Asia. But Asians still are, the, the smallest number of Christians are, are, are to be found in Asia. Well, this is not an evangelism class or ecumenics class or a class on world religions. So I'm not going to go any farther into an analysis of that. If you consider the fact that there are now 2.3 billion Christians, and the Apostle Paul, after Jesus, was probably the most influential person, he and the Apostle Peter, for getting the Christian message out and explaining it to the world. So let's take a look at the Apostle uh, Paul. Now, this is called an icon. Are you familiar with icons? The, ba the Baptists don't have icons, uh, don't use icons, but in much of the Eastern world, the, the Orthodox world, how about the Anglican Church? Anglican Church uses icons. An icon is a, it's just, I don't know how to describe it easily, but it's, a, it's an image, often surrounded by gold, that highlights a particular religious figure. It can be Jesus, it could be the Mary, the mother of Jesus, Joseph, Apostle Paul, or Peter, or, or some other apostle. And in an Orthodox church in particular, and this is an Orthodox church in St. Petersburg, Russia, they, have, they created these huge icons so that when people come to worship God, they also see these icons which serve to inspire them for their own faith. For me, the Apostle Paul has been very inspirational. But as a Baptist, I don't have many pictures of him. I just know about him from reading the Bible. But as I've become more of a global Christian, not just a Baptist Christian, an American Christian, I discovered that other traditions actually have made some images that are beautiful and powerful. And they can help us as we're reflecting on spiritual thoughts. So this is one image that I think is particularly uh, stunning uh, and interesting uh, that depicts the Apostle Paul. Okay, now I'll sit down. Now I'll go to the notes. That was all introduction. From a historical point of view, Paul's writings represent the earliest extant New Testament documents. Uh, do you know the word extant? Extant means that we still have them. They didn't 
they didn't get, get lost. So they're still available for us to find them and to read them. In them, he openly focuses on the kerygma, message preached, which evangelists have proclaimed throughout the world over the centuries, especially among the Protestants. B, while the Gospels present themselves as the life and teaching of Jesus before the establishment of the church, they were clearly written by the post-resurrection church and were written after most of Paul's writings. From a theological point of view, Paul's extensive writings provide far more theological material to draw on for reconstructing the theology of the early church than other New Testament writers provide. And then D, thematically, Paul's interest in Jesus is limited to Jesus' death and resurrection. He focuses on the era of the post-resurrection church and post-coming of the Holy Spirit. Post means after. In fact, Paul can talk about the gospel and the Christian faith with hardly any reference to the earthly life and ministry of the historical Jesus apart from his death and resurrection. So, as I said earlier, and now I'm saying again, Paul is in a primacy, is like first place, he's in a central place for doing New Testament theology. Now, let me make a few comments about how, how scholars draw on Paul's letters to discuss this theology. Some of this, I, I believe you should have already had in your New Testament introduction class. Most scholars today focus on the seven undisputed letters of Paul. That's Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1st Thessalonians, and Philemon. And so they focus on those seven letters to, to reconstruct his theology. Uh, and the reason they focus there is because that allows all scholars to join in the conversation, join in the debate and discussion, because everybody agrees these, these seven letters were written by Paul. But as you know, there are other letters, at least six other letters in the New Testament, that, are, that some believe were also written by Paul. The early church declared they're written by Paul, but modern scholars debate the issue. Sometimes they're called Deutero-Paul. Deutero just means second, or secondarily Paul. Biblical writings that are designated Deutero-Paul writings are largely congruent with Paul's teaching, but they're not necessarily written by Paul himself. The authorship of this Deutero-Pauline epistles is disputed. So you'll see that in the literature sometimes. Deutero-Paul disputed. What does disputed mean? It means people argue about it. It's like I say, that was written by Paul. Someone else says, I dispute that. I don't think so. I disagree. So there's a dispute going on. That's what, that's what this means, disputed. Uh, in some cases, the views or teachings allegedly contradict Paul's theology, according to some scholars. So the Deutero-Paul or, and or disputed Paul, Pauline letters include Ephesians and Colossians, which most scholars say are very close to Paul's thought, if not the same. And then you have 2 Thessalonians, which scholars tend to say deviate from Paul's thought. And then you have the three pastoral epistles, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. And for these, there, there's a lot of debate whether or not they really represent Paul or whether they, they go in a different direction. When analyzing Deutero-Pauline and disputed Pauline texts, scholars look for points of agreement, what we might call logical extensions of Paul's thought from the undisputed seven epistles, and what might be reversals or movements in different directions from Paul's earlier writings. C. Traditionally, there is a 14th book of the New Testament that has been attributed to Paul, the book of Hebrews. However, today, few scholars would argue that Paul was its author. So we will not be referring very often to Hebrews in this, in this course. So now, 
Paul the contextual theologian. Paul the contextual theologian. Paul's theology grew out of what Christ revealed him starting on the road to Damascus. And from his interpretation of the Old Testament, and from his interpretation of the Old Testament in light of the resurrection of Christ and the coming of the Holy Spirit on believers. Now that should sound very familiar. That, that sentence I just read to you, remember on Wednesday, I talked about James Dunn's idea of, what's, his, what's that, that word that he created or, or someone created that he uses? Theologizing. Theologizing. By which he means someone takes the ideas from where, where, did, where did the New Testament writers take their ideas? It came from where? Okay, Jesus, Holy Spirit, and Judaism. Is that what you're saying? Judaism. Yes, that's right. So that's good, that's good. You're, you're already ahead of last year's class. All right, so second, second week, many of you already get this idea. This is very important because for many reasons it's important. But one additional reason it's important that I didn't mention last time is I believe that the, the New Testament writers give us an example of doing contextual theology. And one of the goals of the school is to help you learn how to do contextual theology. Now I'll warn you, we don't really know how to do contextual theology very well at MIT. Is that because we're an inferior school? No. It's because nobody knows. We're all trying to learn throughout the world how to do contextual theology. We just, we know enough to know this is important. And so we're trying to understand better what does it mean to do theology out of a context. Not just out of the context, but at least in the context. And so what I'm emphasizing now is, is Paul also had a context. And so a New Testament scholarship is not just reading the words, but trying to understand what these words mean in its original context, where they came from contextually, and then ultimately how they might apply to your context. See, this is a big job. It's a big job for scholars and pastors. But that's why we're, we spend so much time on it, to try to teach you. Okay, so B, when he wrote letters, Paul was not a speculative theologian who created new philosophies or theories about God. Right, do you know that word speculative? This is important. Speculative. If something's speculative, that means I'm just thinking about it in my mind. I'm imagining it. I'm creating it in my mind. So philosophy has often been, I mean, it, I shouldn't say often, but sometimes is speculative. They imagine how God might have worked in, in the universe. But sometimes philosophy comes from the ground up. In other words, it looks at what's real. How do people live? What's truly wise living? And they build their philosophy from the ground up. Speculation comes from ideas down to us. Practical theology, practical reflection, practical philosophy comes from the ground up. I think we need both. We need to know what's going on in our world concretely. But God's given us a mind to imagine also and to think. Well, there's one other source of information for doing theology, and that's revelation. Revelation is when God, through His Holy Spirit, gives us ideas in our mind that apply to both God, whom we cannot see, and to our lives, which we can see. And so, you remember the diagram I wrote on the board about sources for your beliefs. Many different sources, but ideas, speculation is one source. What we didn't put on there is revelation. I put the Bible. But revelation is that God reveals to us what we cannot know on our own. That's very important in the Christian tradition. 
We believe that we, we cannot know enough about God just by looking at the stars and looking at, at creation. We need God to reveal truth to us. And that's what happened on the road to Damascus, right? For Paul. Paul was going to Damascus to do what? Why was Paul traveling to Damascus? He was called Saul back then. He had to kill Christians, to arrest them and kill them. But Jesus revealed himself in person on the road to Damascus. That's revelation. Okay. Now revelation usually comes through apostles and prophets biblically. And, and it's recorded in the Bible. And that's why much of the Bible is full of prophetic writings, prophets' writings, apostles' writings in the New Testament. Because it's our belief that God revealed truth to them that they shared with us. But sometimes the revelation comes through experience. Mount Sinai experience. Deliverance from Egypt experience. Jesus being resurrected from the dead experience. Jesus on the road to Damascus to Paul, that's experience. So there's a lot of revelation through experience as well. Okay, so I'm trying to help you understand where our beliefs come from, where your beliefs come from, where Christian beliefs come from. And so now back to the Apostle Paul, what I'm saying is he's not a speculative theologian. He didn't come and sit at a desk, look out the window and take his pen and say, I wonder what God is like. Hmm, I think God is like, uh, oh, really great. I think God is beautiful. I think God is powerful. Hmm. I think God is connected to all things in the universe. I think humans are God. Yeah. We can speculate all, all day long, right? And people do. Theologians do. That's called speculative theology. The problem is you never know if they're right or wrong. Because there's just an idea. You may like the idea, you may hate the idea, but it's still an idea. That's what speculative theology does. Paul never speculates. Paul either communicates what's been revealed to him by God. So again, this is his point of view. You could say he's speculating, but he says he's not. He says this is revelation from God. Or it's Paul's, what I call, theologizing. He's looking at the context. So God reveals truth about, about Christ, about God, about the church to Paul. But as he looks out at the people that he works with and tries to explain what he knows to them, that's a theologizing. And so his ideas get expanded. And he tries to explain them this way, then that way, then another way. And to one group of people, he says it like this. To another group of people, he says it like this. Did he change his mind? I don't think so. It's that different contexts require different explanations. And so this is what we, what we mean when we say that, that his influence is a contextual theologian. Some's some of his thinking is revealed, but some of it is applied by him to different contexts. And that's why his letters read differently. Now scholars debate, do they uh, contradict each other? Well, I don't think so. But they don't all say the same thing. So to do New Testament theology, we have to read carefully. And when we have different ideas expressed in different ways, we should pause, think about that, and say, is this idea a revealed truth for all times, all situations? Or is this just the way Paul chose to explain something for this context? But maybe there's another way to say the same thing. Well, how do you know? You look at another letter and see if he did that. Did he explain it in a different way, in a different context? Or we discuss it together? Because we do our theologizing today, in 2018. And we talk about these same things and say, what does this mean? 
And what about this? And what about that? It's that conversation is the ongoing work of theology or theologizing. Okay, that's A. So B, oh, I, I already started B. Uh, B1 said his letters came from personal experience with God. I, I mentioned that. I said that was his experience. And then two, his recipients were largely churches he founded, many of whom were people he introduced to Christ. And so, again, I think in church history, you, sh you may have studied already the, the uh, Paul's missionary journeys. Is that correct? Okay. So this is, you can Google this. You can find this information. Everything's on the internet. Uh, on the web. But here is Paul's, in red is Paul's first missionary journey out of Antioch. And he went, he sailed down here to Cyprus and he went up here into what's called Asia Minor. It's what they used to be called Asia Minor. Now it's Turkey in the modern world. He went up here and uh, he went all the way out here. Then he came back home. That was his first journey. So when he goes on these journeys, he's not a tourist, all right? He's a missionary. He's taking the gospel. And so he's preaching the gospel, usually first of all to the Jews. According to Acts, most of the Jews rejected the gospel. So then he preached the gospel to the Gentiles. So the churches that were founded in many of these cities are made up of some Jews and many Gentiles or, or, or non-Jewish people. Later on, he took a second missionary journey. Started in Antioch. This time, he went over land. And he went back. He visited some of the same churches again that, had, that he had founded. Then he went all the way up there to Troas and then over into Macedonia. Do you remember Acts chapter 16? The vision of the Macedonian who said, Come to us, come to us. Paul wanted to go up to Bithynia and Pontus. But he said the Holy Spirit closed the door. We don't know what that means exactly. But instead he had a dream or a vision of, of some, a Macedonian person saying, come to us with the gospel. And so he went over there to places like Philippi and Thessalonica and, and Neapolis and Amphipolis and Berea. And then down to Corinth and Athens. And we, we read about those in Acts. Uh, and, and Paul's missionary journey. And eventually he went over to Ephesus which was one of the primary places uh, that he spent years in ministry establishing the church and teaching leaders. And then he eventually came all the way back down here to Jerusalem and then went back to Antioch again, which is where, that was his home base in Antioch. Later, he took a third missionary journey. From here, he went out back again through Asia Minor, over this time to Ephesus, up again visiting the churches in Macedonia and uh, down back to Corinth and the Athens. And, and then this time he, he went, he w actually walked back up all the way around and then bypassed Ephesus and came down to Miletus and then came all the way back here to Jerusalem. And then some say hey, there were four journeys, but this map just has the three journeys on it. Uh, but again, what I'm... This isn't a history class, but I want you to see that Paul's ideas and all of his communication is connected to real people and real places. And so in that way, Paul's a lot closer to you than he is, he would be to the philosophers of the ancient world. Because when you're done here at school, you're going to go back to probably the villages or to your hometown and you're going to be ministering to real people in a real context with spiritual truth. That's what Paul did. And so when we read his writings, don't think of them just as abstract philosophical ideas or theological ideas. Paul intends that everything he writes about God and about Christ and about the Spirit is for you, is for the people. It's for churches, it's for communities, it's for contexts. He cares about real people in real contexts. And everything he writes should be considered from that perspective. Alright, C, 
Uh, I already mentioned that, uh, that when he preached, he did to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. Um, point number one, when he preached to the Jews, he found that many were very traditional in their beliefs and resistant to a new interpretation of the Old Testament and to hearing about Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Two, when he preached to Gentiles, he was proclaiming the gospel in religiously pluralistic settings where most people were pagan, polytheists who worshipped multiple gods and participated in religious festivals. Okay, so again, when we read Paul, we have to understand he, there are at least two completely different audiences in mind. There's more than that, but generally speaking, there was the audience that were the Jewish Christians that came out of the traditional Jewish beliefs. And then there was the, those who, who belonged to the religiously pluralistic, uh, sometimes polytheistic, often polytheistic, religious settings. Very different. And so what I'm giving you here in point number D is I'm giving you some ideas of what, what might be a modern parallel. If Paul were preaching today uh, in, in a way that was similar to the people he, he preached to 2,000 years ago, Number one, he might be preaching to Hindus in India today where most people believe in many gods and participate regularly in religious rites and festivals. Okay, so that's a modern day context that would be similar. Two, preaching to Buddhists in Myanmar, for example in Mandalay or Yangon today, where the vast majority of people do not believe in God, do not know God, and follow the teaching and practices of Buddha and the Buddhist monks in a religious sort of way. Okay? So, taking the gospel to Buddhists in our context is not that different from Paul when he took the gospel to the Romans and Greeks in his day. Number three, preaching to ethnic minorities in Myanmar who live in remote villages who practice animism in tribal religions. These people are highly superstitious and believe in many spirits, nets. Okay, now, I don't think a lot of Paul's writings were to people exactly like that, but there are some points of connection, and, and we'll try to identify them as we go along. Now, here, here's one that might surprise you, number four. Preaching the gospel in Baptist churches, where some people are Christians because of tradition rather than a relationship with God through Christ, or have not experienced the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Okay, let me ask you a controversial question. Well, first is not controversial. What percentage of people in Northern Chin State are Christians? How many Chins do we have here? What, what percentage? Ruff, roughly. 10%? 20? 50? I think you're shy. It's 90 or 100 percent. 90 or 100 percent of Christians. Now, think about it. Do you think they're all really Christians? Okay. What I mean by that is they all go to a Christian church because that's the culture. But what we're going to read about when we read Paul's gospel is that a relationship with God is not about belonging to a religious tradition. And so, as you think about bringing the gospel or sharing the gospel in your context, it, let's say you're 90 or, or Kachin State as a high percentage of Christians. You think about preaching and teaching in that context, just because the people are Christians Christians, quote unquote, doesn't mean they have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying they don't. Don't, don't, don't pick up stones and stone me. Um, I'm saying you ought to question it. When the percentage is so high, you should say, is it real for all those people? See, that, that's what Paul was dealing with when he was talking to the Jewish people. So he was talking to people who were culturally Jewish people. 
They were Jewish by tradition. And he was challenging them and saying, just because you are traditionally Jewish, just because you have this background, doesn't mean you have a relationship with God. And so when you read that, Paul's dialogue with the Jewish people, don't say in your mind, oh, well, I'm not Jewish, so it doesn't apply to me. Instead think, hmm, I'm from also cultural Christians. And maybe what he said to the Jews also applies to cultural Christians today. Okay, so I hope you understand what I'm saying here. We're trying, I'm trying at the very beginning, before we even read any of his words, to get you to think about context, to think about these categories a little bit differently. So that you can understand what it is we really have when we read these words and what the importance of these words is. As you might imagine that there have been, over the last hundreds of years, especially, especially since uh, the Enlightenment, the 1800s, 1900s, uh, 2000s already, uh, many, many, many people are studying, many scholars are studying the Apostle Paul. And so there's been a lot of debate as to what really is the center of his belief. And the reason the center is so important is because they, they think, scholars say, think that if we can identify the center, then when he applies the teaching to Philippi or to Thess Thessalonica or to Rome or to, in, to, Gal to churches in Galatia uh, or to people like Timothy or to other places, we'll know the core of his thinking and we'll see that all the other teaching is, is application. They call it contingency. Core and contingency uh, was a, 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 there was a man, a professor by the name of uh, Becker in my school when I went to seminary. And he wrote a book called Core and Contingency. The core of Paul's thought, contingency means the particular place of application that's not the same as some other place. Uh, so there's, if you, in the back of your guide, you'll see there are a number of appendices. And so that's for those of you who are interested in, in going into more depth on some of these subjects. And so whenever something we're studying has additional information in the appendix, in, in an appendix, there'll be a footnote at the bottom of the page. Uh, so I'm just, again, telling you this so that you know how to use your guide. But on one of the appendices, I have a picture there of, of Becker's core and contingency theory. And, and I talk about that a little bit. But what I'm going to do now in this lecture is share with you what I believe the core of Paul's theology is. The core, that means the center of his theology. And then we will discuss other possible cores and other possible ways to think about God and other possible philosophies. So that you can have a better appreciation for who Paul is and, and, and what his particular emphasis was. In Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, uh, we have a statement by Paul that sums up so much of what he believes. And I put it up here on the screen. And so read it with me. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So when you look at this, these two verses, what do you see that has theological significance? Okay, power. All right, good. What else? Righteousness. Okay, good. What else? Faith. Good. What else? Salvation. Good. What else? Yeah, power of God. And we said faith already. Yes. Okay. There's even more. There's so much in these two verses. What? God is revealed. Remember we just talked about 
Revelation. Okay, Re so he mentions Revelation. What else? The scope of salvation. Salvation of everyone who believes. All right? And then there's the distinction between the Jew and the Gentile. All right, now look at your guide here. I, I, I spelled these out here in a little bit more detail. Number one, the gospel is power. All right, let me pause there. Why is that significant to say the gospel is power? What else could it be? It's not power. It could be just an idea. Right? It could just be a belief. Right? So if I tell you that in a week we're going to have three day holiday. So that might be good news for you if you like holidays. But there's, I don't think there's much power in that message. It's good news, but not powerful good news. So Paul is saying that there's something more than, even though it is good news, gospel means, euangelion, means good news. He's saying that, that when this good news is preached, it comes with power. When we use a word like power, when we use a word like um, oh, uh, philosophy, we might think of an idea, it's intellectual. Right? We think of the mind. When we, when we use a word like power, we think about experience. It's experiential. So one of the things that I'm going to emphasize over and over again this semester is that in order to understand New Testament theology, you must understand that it's both a collection of ideas and it's experiential. If you graduate from MIT with only ideas, you haven't learned all that you need to learn about the gospel and about theology. It's experiential as well as intellectual. All right, the gospel is power. Number two, this power comes from God. And so already this is not just, this is, what is this as opposed to? See, whenever you, you read a thinker, an evangelist, a, a prophet, a philosopher, an educated person will think about the ideas you hear vis-a-vis -vis or against alternative ideas so that you can have a sharper idea about the significance of what you're reading. Because if he says it this way, that means there's a different way that somebody else is saying something about God or about religion or about philosophy. And you're gonna, you have to choose what you believe is true. Well, right now, we're mostly concerned with just understanding, listening. What is Paul really saying? So when he says the power comes from God, he's saying it does not come from human beings. It's not humanism. It's not human power. Power does not come from spirits, evil spirits, or good spirits. God is spirit, but God is, a, in Paul's theology, is the creator of the universe. It's a unique being. So the power of his gospel comes from God. Three, God's power brings about our salvation. Again, there's, there's, there's a lot to see in this. Well, salvation, we don't know what he means by salvation. What do you think he means? In, the, in context of these verses, what, what do you think he means? Salvation mean deliverance from people who are trying to harm you? Deliverance from poverty, perhaps. Salvation from, from oppression. From what? Well, he doesn't use the word sin here, but he's going to. <laughs> by the time we get to, to later chapters. The only word that he really uses here that helps us understand the nature of his gospel is the word righteousness. So salvation is linked to righteousness here. And so when we, when we think about 
what does salvation mean to Paul? It has something to do with righteousness. Okay? So be careful. But what I'm trying to get you to do is to read carefully. And not just jump to another theology you learned in another class or another book. Or something you just made up yourself. If we're going to read Paul, we need to read Paul. What does he say? He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel means good news. Because it's power. And the power is from God. And the power brings salvation. That's why he's not ashamed. This is good. This is really good. Really important. So number four, this good news comes first to the Jews who were waiting for God's salvation. And second to the Gentiles who did not know of God's promises but now are included in God's master plan of salvation. Here Paul is theologizing. In other words, he, he's starting with his Jewish heritage. Salvation comes first to the Jews because they were the ones who were waiting for this good news, he says. So in other words, Paul's gospel is, does not begin with Paul. It's a fulfillment of what came before Paul, he says. So there's that continuity. He's in the stream, the theological stream that goes back to ancient Judaism. Number five, the revelation of God, God's character and God's will come in successively more illuminating ways. All right, now he doesn't say this in these two verses. But I want to give you this as a, as a fuller, uh, get this off here, as a fuller understanding. Alright, how, let me just, I don't know if this will go off or not. Yep, it did. Alright, I mentioned to you now several times about revelation. Revelation means that is, is, is what in this con theological context means what God shows us that we wouldn't necessarily know by ourselves. But what we find in the biblical witness is that there's this sense of, of progressive revelation. That means more and more was revealed from God over time about God and about God's will for us. Well, on the outer, the outer circle, when human beings were just living in caves and living in fields, and at the very beginning of time, or I should say the beginning of the human race, and, and uh, tribes and villages were, were growing up, where did they get their information about God? Where did they first think about God? Well, it's hard, maybe hard to know. So let me just say, it, it comes from creation, nature. You know, we have the stars, okay, you know, the sky, the ground. You know, people, people's original native religions often were very much tied to this world, what they could see. And what Paul says later on in chapter 1 of Romans, that we'll talk about a little bit more next week, is that there's so much revealed without any books, without any teachers, without any philosophers or religious leaders, a person who lived out away from everybody else could still look up at the sky and see the, see the stars, and that would make them think about a greater being, a creator of the universe. And, and so what Paul will say to us is, is that this is not, this is what we call general revelation. Or some theologians have called general or natural revelation. It just comes from nature. But in time, in history, God began to reveal more truth to us through whom? Through whom did God speak to us? He has to speak louder. Can't hear Abraham, that's a specific person. So what category do we call that? I mean, he, he spoke to Abraham, a, a specific people. So he, he also spoke, uh, so we can say individuals, 
and notably Abraham, Abram, also prophets, and then in the New Testament, apostles. And so, as, as Revelation progressed, there were specific people who claimed that they heard from God. Now, you and I know there are many people in history who claim to hear from God who are false prophets. But in the Judeo-Christian tradition, we believe that some of them are true prophets. In other words, God really did speak to through these people to reveal truth to us. Truth about who God is, truth about God's will for our lives. But here in the center is the greatest revelation of God of all. What goes in the center? Yeah, do you know that back there? Albert, how about you? Well, who belongs in the center here? Mojo Toon, you're back there, I saw you. Eswun Su, you're back there. I'm in the back row to participate. Yeah, They're, they know up here in the front rows. Do you guys know? The Bible of Jesus. Yeah, see this, this is the Bible. The Bible's here, guys, okay? Jesus Christ alone is here, all right? <laughs> all right, this is, this is important, especially for Baptists. Because sometimes we put the Bible here. Now, now let's be fair. The Bible is what we have. And so that's, that's why people do it. But we have to understand the Bible is a collection of writing of these people. And so these are... The, the truth about Jesus is mediated through these people. It's true. But according to Paul's theology, the great revelation of God is in Jesus Christ. And I was mentioning, I was talking about that in this last lecture, but I'm going to bring it up now and probably many more times. If this is true, if this is how we know who God is more than any other way, Christology is extremely important to New Testament theology and Christian theology. It's indispensable. So as you are formulating and developing your theology, especially over the, your three years here at MIT, you cannot leave out Jesus Christ because this is the greatest, the greatest, most significant part of revelation or, or, or vehicle for revelation. The challenge is, how do you know Jesus Christ? And that kicks us back to this next ring of the Bible and to um, other individuals, some of whom are in the Bible, and honestly, it's only those that are in the Bible that have what we call canonical status. And in other words, we give them authority that other individuals, who are like in our churches and pastors and other speakers over the centuries, uh, God does speak through them. The Apostle Paul says God speaks through prophets, evangelists, teachers, and preachers in every church, in every generation. So that's true. But for the sake of developing our theology, we have a, a select set that has the highest authority for us. And, that, and they're found in the Bible. Okay, so let's go back to our verses here. Number six, in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. In this context, thank you. Paul is referring to the righteousness that God provides to believers in Christ. And that, from the verses that follow here, means being cleansed from our sins and placed in a right relationship with God. Okay, that's what righteousness means. And this is something, again, that's, that we're going to come back to multiple times. Because here in the Myanmar context, one of the leading ideas about, theological ideas about what salvation means is what? What word is used often? Maybe you're too soon in your uh, education. Liberation. Liberation. There you go. <laughs> Albert Cho, do you have a question? A comment? What? I'm saying this that that many times that the idea of salvation is expressed as liberation. 
And that and that's a there are many liberation theologies. We're going to talk about some of them later on in this course. And so what I'm saying here at the very beginning is to notice that Paul is not using the word liberation when he talks about salvation. He's using the word righteousness. And so we're not speaking against liberation because liberation has a, is a very important concept that, that I believe every one of us has to really think about. And at the same time, in this class, New Testament theology, I'm going to keep driving you back to the text. What does the text say? What are the words used in the biblical text? And then you can discuss those words in light of what modern theologians are using in terms of, of their words. And I want, to, I want you to consider, are they this, saying the same thing but using different words? Or are they really saying something a little bit different? And if it's different, what, what theology are you going to believe and accept and live by? Because most of us, in my experience, choose a, a theology based on our feelings, what we want to believe. And we run with it. Like, I like that idea. Boom, we're off. And we, and we claim it's true because we want it to be true. So in this class, I'm, I'm the same way. I'm, we're all, human beings are all like that. So in this class, the academic discipline is to keep going back and say, and ask ourselves, what does the text say? What does Paul actually say? What does John say? What does Matthew say? Et cetera, et cetera. So here I'm pointing out he, the very first word that he connects to salvation in the gospel is righteousness. It's about righteousness. Now B, at other times, on occasion, Paul uses the same Greek word, dikaiosune, to refer to God's righteousness or justice, which translates dikaiosune as justice. Um, excuse me, for example, uh, the New International Version in, in chapter 3 translates to Kayasune as justice. And the New Revised Standard Version translates it as righteousness. Both are correct. And so when we look at texts, we're going to see that, that sometimes it's not clear what is the right translation. And so maybe it's already in your mind, when you think about righteousness, the Greek word to Kayasune, righteousness, justice... Righteousness lends itself to thinking about a right relationship with God. Justice lends itself to thinking about a right relationship with other human beings. So you can see how different theologies might grow out of the same biblical word. So it's not crazy. But it is challenging. We need to think about it. Think about what is appropriate use of these words. Because there are parallel but not identical concepts for us to think about. All right, C. In some verses, it is ambiguous whether Paul is referring to the righteousness that God confers on believers or to the character of God. In other words, is righteousness something that he gives you? Or is righteousness something that is characteristic of God? He's a just God, a righteous God. Well, it's both, but sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other. Okay, point number seven. Those who are made righteous by God do so through faith. I think I used the wrong English word. I'm sorry about that. Those who are made righteous by God are made righteous through faith. Is how it should read. Number eight. Paul was not ashamed of this gospel. Though he would elsewhere say that the gospel, Christ crucified, was foolishness to the Greeks and a stumbling block to the Jews. So he admits other people think it's foolish. And some people think it's incomprehensible or wrong. He says, that may be true, but for me, I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed to proclaim it. Why not? Here's the answer. Because he has experienced the truth of it in power. It had transformed his life. As a result, he was not embarrassed to preach the gospel in a pluralistic, polytheistic context. Nor was he embarrassed to preach it to Jews who prided themselves in their ability to keep the law. 
Okay, I think maybe you should underline those two sentences because I want you to understand what Paul is saying about the gospel is that it's not just an idea to him. The idea was so powerful that it changed his life. And it changes the lives of other people who believe it. And so he's in this context where he's surrounded by, by people who do not believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. They reject it. Some of them persecute him. Some of them think he's foolish. Some of them think he's crazy. But he says, I'm not ashamed of it. Because it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. That's his experience and that's his, his observation and that's his conviction. Okay, that's the, what I believe is the core of, of, of his view of the gospel. Now, other key images or concepts in Paul. The justification language is found primarily in Romans and Galatians, but also on occasion in other letters. For example, 1 Corinthians and Titus. What I mean by justification language, I mean we are justified by faith through grace, right? By, excuse me, by grace through faith. And that idea has become the centerpiece for Protestant theology. But what New Testament scholars observe is that Paul doesn't use that language in every one of his letters. So that makes some scholars wonder, is justification really at the center or is it really a contingent idea? In other words, it's how he explained the gospel in some contexts, uh, but it, it's not the only way to talk about the gospel. He also talks about reconciliation. Of course, gospel is a term he uses often. He's always talking about Christ, in Christ, Christ. And number five, the concept of salvation is something he talks about often, but doesn't always use the concept of justification with salvation. So these are some of the terms, we, the, the, the key terms that Paul uses over and over again, um, but in some letters more than other letters. Gerald G. O. Collins explains that according to Paul, salvation means life in Christ. The gift of the Holy Spirit, peace with God, justification, being a new creation, enjoying reconciliation, and existence as the adopted sons and daughters of God. So in other words, even though earlier I said salvation is really mostly about righteousness, what Colin says to us is if we read all of the letters of Paul, we realize it's about many things. Righteousness, yes, that's key, but it, it's more than just forgiveness for sins. There are many things here, and, and we'll talk about uh, some of them as we go along. All right, so now let's go on and talk about the core of his theology. Uh, so far, we we're talking at A, we were talking about the gospel and key images Paul uses. But now I want to talk about, again, about the core of Paul's theology. And I'm going to give you five major points here. The core of Paul's theology is what we just talked about, the gospel, which announces salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and transforms our relationship to God, to ourselves, and to others by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's one sentence that explains what I believe is the core of Paul's theology. I'd like you to memorize that sentence. Okay? I'd like you to memorize that sentence. Because I'm going to ask you in the midterm, what is the core of Paul's theology? That's not the time to start guessing <laughs> or making something up. This is what I want you to learn. Now, if you want to develop your own idea, I, I'm happy to hear your own idea. If you can support it with Paul's writings, Good. But this is, this is the definition I'm giving you. So you can put a star by it if you want in your notes. Now, because I want you to have a short version, a short way of saying what I believe is the core of Paul's theology. But let me talk about this in uh, a little bit more detail. First of all, 
for Paul, we have the power of the cross. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is, is, to me is a marvelous summary of what Paul believed about the central roles of both grace and faith. Let's go back to your guide where the, there's an explanation there. It says, sinners are saved by grace through faith. Grace is God's unmerited gifts to human beings. God takes the initiative to reach out to humanity with love, mercy, and ongoing provision for our needs in various ways. The chief of which is through the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those who are saved from the consequences and power of sin are those who experience the grace of God and put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior and as their Lord. All right, number three. The ongoing work or role of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.16 says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And then verses 22 through 25. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Okay, so the Holy Spirit is absolutely indispensable to Paul's theology. Right, do you see that? Again, I, as I mentioned last time about Baptists, we, we, em we rightly emphasize Jesus Christ as Baptists, but we should also be emphasizing the role of the Holy Spirit, according to these verses and Paul's teaching. So the, the paragraph we have here in your guide, believers are filled with and transformed by the Holy Spirit. We're transformed by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ and the internal working of the Holy Spirit. We're given the ability to believe in God's promises. We're enabled to receive God's love, to love ourselves and to love others. God's grace leads us to real repentance where we turn away from sin and embrace the life God intends for us. Compare what Gandhi said in one form or another. He said, I like Christ, but not Christians. Okay, something like that. And the idea was, what he was saying is, you know, Jesus Christ is phenomenal. His teachings were magnificent. But those who follow him don't seem to me to be very much like Christ. Well, Paul would say the reason for that is they're not being led by the Holy Spirit. And that's why in your theology, as well as your, and our future teaching and preaching, we should not preach a gospel that only focuses on forgiveness of sins through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the beginning. But it's not the end of the gospel. The good news is that our sins are forgiven and we can live a new life through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now I know for some of you, this is, this is maybe not completely new, but it's something that was not emphasized in your church. And so let me, this is maybe a good time for me to say that in this course, when we emphasize the Holy Spirit, especially in Paul, it's not because we're Pentecostals, because most of us aren't. It's because it's in the text. And it's core, it's significant to Paul's theology. And we as Baptists need, in my opinion, to do a better job understanding and then applying what it means to live by the Spirit. Now I'm not even talking about charismatic gifts. I'm not talking about signs and wonders and miracles. Uh, those even have their place. I'm talking about the things I just read to you. The Holy Spirit's work enable you to believe in Christ, to accept that forgiveness, to accept God's love. That's the work of the Spirit. Your ability to become compassionate toward others in need and then to act on that compassion, not out of anger and rage and violence, but to act out of compassion with love and and reason and thoughtfulness and dedication and sacrifice, that comes from the Spirit. Those fruit of the Spirit we just read, we heard preached about at church in chapel yesterday. 
I mean, those are all signs of God at work in our lives through the Holy Spirit. It's one of the important points in Paul's theology. Okay, let's go on to the next point. God's faithfulness. Uh, let's read 2 Corinthians 1.20. Somebody read that verse for us. What Paul is saying is, for no matter how many promises God has made, what does he say? They are yes in Christ. You know, a lot of theological thought has gone into this one verse. But the reason I chose it for this section is that the Old Testament is full of promises of God. That's what the Jewish people were looking for. They, were, they knew God's promises and they were looking for the fulfillment of God's promises. When God fulfills His promises, we say that He is, what? Faithful. Faithful. So that's why number four is God's faithfulness. It means that He's faithful to fulfill His promises. Just about every other day in chapel, somebody chooses the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Right? It's, one of, it's my fate, one of my favorites. I'm glad they do. Uh, because it's such a core hymn, right, of our, of our faith. Great is thy faithfulness. Why is it so important to us? Because you and I need to believe, need to know that the God in whom we have put our trust is faithful to his promises. And for Paul, he says, this is important. God is faithful and you can rely on it. Some of God's promises have been fulfilled already. Some are still going to be fulfilled in the future. But what he's also saying here, that's an additional theological point, is that he says no matter how many promises we have in God, they are, they are yes. What he means is they are fulfilled in, they are completed in who? What did, what did we just read? They are yes in Christ. They're yes in Christ. And so Paul's theology is that everything that up to that point that we were looking for, or I should say the greatest things we were looking for, are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. This is great, great example of theologizing. Right? And all of Paul's years, decades of learning about Jewish theology and Judaism, he learned about God's promises, God's faithfulness to the Jews in the past, especially through the exodus out of Egypt. He learned, he learned about God's promises in the prophets through Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and others and Daniel and others. But he never learned about Jesus. Never. And so Paul was a theologian, a Jewish theologian, a Pharisee, who could teach all about God's activity and history through the Jews and all about God's promises through the prophets. But he could not teach about Jesus until there was Jesus, until Jesus came. And so the addition of Jesus required further theological thought. It required theologizing taking what he had from the past and then <coughs> taking what he had in the present and connecting the two things together. How was he to understand his experience of Jesus with all that he had learned before? When he connects those together, he's doing theology. He's theologizing. And his answer is this. All the Old Testament promises are yes in Christ. They're fulfilled in Christ. So that has led some theologians to say Paul's theology is Christocentric. Christ has to be at the center. Now, heads up, not all theologians agree with that. As I told you last session too, there's a lot, there was a lot of theological effort in the last 50 70 years to make theology more theocentric, God-centered, for all the reasons I talked about last time. 
But please, in this class, we're reading Paul. What does Paul say? All right? So at least here, on this point, he's Christocentric. But as we're going to see, in the end, he can't separate theocentric and Christocentric. Or, and he can't take the spirit out of the center. Because what Paul really does is he has the Trinity in the center. He's Trinity-centric, if you will. <laughs> and, and that's why I think we have trouble today. That's why we have debates. People say, no, he's, he's theocentric. No, he's Christocentric. And I say, no, he's trini Trinity-centric. Because you cannot adequately explain or understand Paul's theology without God the Father, Jesus Christ, and, and the Holy Spirit. They're all absolutely necessary, indispensable. As we're already seeing here, aren't we? Grace and faith in Christ, the ongoing role of the Spirit. God's faithfulness, but in Christ. Okay, next. Number five. Christian vocation and calling. As sinners saved by grace, believers are called to live a Christ-centered, Spirit-led life filled with good works, witness, and Christian service as we become more and more like Christ. Now, Ephesians 2.10. Somebody read Ephesians 2.10 for us. For we are God's handiwork or workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Okay. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 say so much of what Paul believes. That's why there's such precious verses for us. But this, and I'm, I separated them out so that I could make this separate point, number five, is that every one of us is called to a life of good works. But those good works come out of our relationship with Christ. So when we do our interfaith dialogue and interface with, with say, Buddhists or Hindus or Muslims, and we want to talk about doing good social work in, our, in Myanmar, as we should. We should be linking arms with others to do good works, to dig wells, to provide food and education. We should be working with other religions. But just because we do good works with others, other religious people who also value good works, it does not mean that we understand the good works we're doing in the same way. All these religions believe in good works, and so we all should do good works. But the Christian concept of good works is that they grow out of a relationship with Jesus Christ, and they are empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's, see, that's the Trinity. God the Father called us all to this, but it's a relationship with Christ that, that gives us the, the, the perspective on the world to know what these good works mean in light of God's purposes. And it's the Holy Spirit that enables us to do the good works for the right reasons and in God's way. That's the Christian way of good works. That's Paul's theology. Okay, so these five points are points we're going to come back to in different ways as we go through the different letters of Paul. But I wanted to give you a list so that you had uh, a short list of some of the most important concepts that Paul talks about. And believe me, there are more, but this is the short list. But what you have here in your notes, and we don't really have time to talk about them all, uh, but I, I point out here in the second section, there are some other ideas about what Paul's uh, other, other ideas about philosophical or theological cores. This is Paul's, but when we read Matthew, we're going to hear some different language and some different emphases. You know, Matthew is going to talk about law and Jesus, lived righteousness. Luke is going to emphasize Jesus, of course, and repentance, forgiveness of sins, and social activism. Mark is going to talk about Jesus, of course, and servanthood and dying to self. Now these don't contradict Paul, but there are different ways to express their theological emphases. All right, the Roman Catholic Church and the Anglicans and Eastern Orthodox Church. I, I'm just not going to take time, but I, I, I put these 
these different emphases here for, for those of you who are interested in reading more about them. But you also should know, Roman numeral 3, that there are non-Christian theological, philosophical views uh, tend to go farther away from what we find in the Christian tradition, no matter who the writer is. In Judaism, we have law and covenant, historically sacrifices, a Messiah, Moses, obedience, and mercy. And, and you need to know there's a traditional Christian perspective on Judaism. Salvation came to those who faithfully observed the Torah, and Paul was opposed to Judaism. And his gospel of grace was a radical departure from the Judaism of his day. That's probably what you were taught in your church, if you were taught about this. But there's been something called the new, the new perspective on Paul. And I'm going to skip down to number three. E.P. Sanders, among others, argue that the Judaism of Paul's day already was grounded in grace. His work has prompted what was called what is called the new perspective on Paul. The two major assumptions are these. Judaism was fundamentally a religion of grace, and there wasn't much one had to do to remain in the covenant. In other words, everybody was in, and everybody was going to stay in. The reason Jesus was opposed was he was a lawbreaker. He deliberately provoked the religious leaders by flagrant lawbreaking. Uh, and then, then there's some more. Some more. Uh, so I won't go into more detail about that, but just I'm just alerting you that there are some other other theological perspectives. Hellenism <coughs> emphasized multiple gods, philosophy, logic, and reason, eternal soul. Humanism, glory and the potential of human beings. Materialism, what matters most is the physical world and acquisition of possessions. And I say here, beware of the materialism that masquerades as theology, the health and wealth gospel. Perhaps even some liberation theologies might actually be materialism at the core. Uh, and, and that's not uh, the same as what we find in Paul. Buddhism, self-effort to detach from those desires that produce suffering. And as you know, or you may know, there's two major branches of Buddhism. Theravada Buddhism, sometimes called Hinayana, or lesser, visit, lesser vehicle, traditional Buddhism. It's very individualistic and focuses on a self-effort to escape the world of suffering and to reach the state or experience of Nirvana. That's, that's the, fo the form we have here in Myanmar. <coughs> the Buddhist perspective is that, to quote, uh, one Buddhist monk, he says, no one saves us but ourselves. So at its core, in terms of soteriology, Buddhism and Paul's theology are diametrically opposed. Uh, they, there is no overlap when it comes to their idea about what can cause, what can bring about liberation or salvation. Now the Mahayana Buddhism, the greater vehicle, has developed to include concepts of deity like bodhisattvas. A bodhisattva is an enlightened individual who instead of going up into nirvana or out to nirvana, wherever it may be, it's not a place, but a state of existence, they choose to stay connected to human beings to help all people to reach enlightenment. Forms of Buddhism that belong to the Mahayana family pray to Buddha and seek help from Buddha and thus are far less self-reliant and more similar, not the same as, but closer to the Christian faith and to reliance on Christ. Uh, but a pastor, Hideki, uh, we, who's, uh, who, who serves here in Yangon, uh, who comes from Japan, uh, told me that, he says, that may be the official view of Buddhism in Japan, uh, but most of Buddhists in Japan do not know the official teaching. And so most Buddhists in Japan are cultural Buddhists. They have their traditions. They have their, their belief in the ancestors and their honoring ancestors. And so to them, to be Japanese is to be Buddhist. And, just, and it's very similar in this country. For many Buddhists, uh, to be Burmese is to be Buddhist. And 
It's not so much about religion, it's, it's, it's their identity. Uh, and so that's important to understand as you're trying to understand about, more about world religions and about what Christianity is vis-a-vis uh, -vis or in face of other religions. All right, we covered a lot of ground, uh, but to introduce you the core of Paul's theology and give you, and we sought to give you a little bit of an idea about what other religions might emphasize other than what he emphasizes here. But what I want to do is give you now uh, just a short, you're just going to take a five minute break. It's more of a stretching break. You run to the bathroom or something, get some water, but come back here because we want to do some work in small groups and so we can have a little bit of discussion. But most scholars think that most of what we find in these other books are Paul's thoughts. Well, the way that you test it out is by comparing, in this case, what you find in Ephesians 2, 8, and 10 with what you find in the other books. And in Galatians and Romans, all of these ideas that are in, in Romans 2, 8, 9, and 10 are there. But instead of giving you six chapters to summarize Paul, I just gave you three verses in Ephesians because it summarizes Paul's thought in Romans and Galatians uh, particularly so well. All right, so very good question. That means you're thinking, and that's what I want for this class, be thinking and challenging. What you're going to do now is more thinking. I want you to gather with the people right around you, and it just be just do five or six people. Just turn your chairs, and you only have about, well, <clears throat> maybe, maybe 10 or 12 minutes. So this is just a, uh, just a short time to talk, and, the, and your, your discussion questions are right here in your guide. It says, what do you think about Paul's theology, especially these five points? Does it touch you? Does it resonate with your own faith and experience with God? Do you, do you know that word resonate, the English word? Resonates like a vibration. So like when, when I talk about Paul's theology, does it like vibrate inside of you? Say, yes, yes, that's true. Or does it sound like, no, this is strange and this is not what I believe. Or it... Or I don't understand it. So in other words, I'm asking, how do you respond to it? How does it connect with what you, you experience or what you think? And, and, and how so, if it does or if it doesn't? If, if, if something's missing in his theology, what's missing? What do you think he's neglecting that should be there? All right, now we haven't studied all of his theology. This is just, just to get us started here. Right? So, what I want you to do, and then the last thing is, what questions about Paul's theology do you have? I won't answer all these questions, but don't worry, I think we'll come back to all of them before we're done. Uh, but, but first of all, what does it mean that the church is the true Israel? In Paul's thought, the church is what Israel, well, let me start over. Israel is no longer, in Paul's thinking, just the Jewish people. Israel, who are the people of the promise of God, are the people that trusted in God's promises. And historically, that was the Jewish people 
for centuries, but with the coming of Christ, Paul's global view is that the church now represents what Israel was before. So much so that we can call the church the new Israel, the true Israel. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? And so, if Israel are the people of God, Israel should have accepted Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of God's promises. Those who did accept the promises became part of the church. So the church includes all the Jewish people who accepted Christ as their promised Messiah, plus all the Gentiles who also accepted Christ. All right, make sense? All right, number two, can we say Jesus is God's grace to human beings? Uh, right? People are commenting. Uh, can, can we say Jesus is God's grace to human beings? Uh, yes, I think we can say that. Now, the understanding of grace uh, needs to be explained. Grace is, is God's gift. There is, some of grace means simply what God does for us. Some of, grace, some of what grace means is how God works in our lives. And so, I can, I can give you a gift and you can, you can, hold, you can hold the gift. But, but when you start to use the gift, so I gave you a phone. And so now you hold the phone and say, oh, I got this gift from, from the teacher. But when you start to use it, then it becomes more beneficial to you. And so the grace is not just receiving a gift, but it's how it works in your life. Now that's not a perfect analogy, it's just the one I can think of right now. And what it, what it means is that, is that God's grace is that he offers forgiveness to those who put their faith in him. But Jesus is a concrete manifestation of his grace. That means God's love for us, God's desire to help us, is manifested in Jesus. So here's Jesus as a person, but what really makes that grace for us is what Jesus did for us, and then also what, um, what Jesus does for us through his spirit on an ongoing basis today. Three, is Paul inclusive or exclusive missionary? Well, he's both, okay? He's inclusive in the sense that he believes the gospel is for the whole world. But he believes people of other religions need to hear about Jesus Christ. So that sense, some would call him exclusive. But he's inclusive in the sense that he wants to include everybody. All right? that, is, that is not the way ancient Judaism was. Ancient Judaism was exclusive, and they did not want to include anybody else. They thought, we have our own covenant, we're the people of God, and everyone else can just do what they want to do. That was not Paul's view. Paul's view was that, yes, the P Jews were the people of God, but through Christ... There's now, God has come into the world and has a message of hope for the entire world. And so this is very relevant for, for us in this context. Because you live in a religiously pluralistic context here. And so the question is, is Christ just for you? Or is he for the Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims as well? According to Paul. But what do you think? If Paul brought the message to the Jews, to the Greeks, to the Romans, did he think the message was for others? Yes, he did. Okay, number four, is the Holy does, is the, I think it means, does the Holy Spirit work in unbelievers? Yes and no. <laughs> so the yes part is that the very spirit of very life that you and I have comes from the Spirit of God. And so every human being is connected 
by virtue of the fact that we have a common spirit of God that gives us life. But in the New Testament, when the New Testament writers speak about the Holy Spirit's activity in human lives, they talk about a greater sense of the Spirit's working that gives us an ability to believe in God, to believe in God's message of salvation through Christ, to accept that message, to be changed by that message, to have the Spirit dwell in us, to change our lives, to guide us, to lead us, to help us to be able to, to live more like Christ. The, the non-believers do not have that kind of hope, that, that access to the Holy Spirit. So for me, I found this to be a, a difficult question to answer in the past. And, but this is the answer that I've come to. Is that yes, everyone has the Spirit, but what the New Testament writers write about is there's a greater experience of the Spirit that God wants for the world that only is available to Christians who put their faith in Christ and receive the Spirit. Number five, how can believers and non-believers communicate with each other if only believers have the Spirit? Well, I'm not, I think I answered that question already. We, we can all communicate because we, we're all alive. I, mean, I can talk, you can talk. We don't have to be Christians to talk. But I'll tell you this, a non-Christian cannot understand the heart of Christ or the will of God in the same way. They cannot, in my experience. Now, there are some, it's surprising though, to me, that there are conversations, there are points of connection. I have Muslim friends uh, I, I, and I, that I've talked to and I find they have many things in common with Christians in terms of values, honoring God, obeying God, doing good, giving alms. But something changes when you really accept Christ and you experience the forgiveness of God through Christ uh, that just isn't available. I talked to a, a Buddhist taxi driver one time here in town and he, he became a Christian. He was Buddhist. He became a Christian. I said, well, why did you become a Christian? You have a religion. He said, in Buddhism, there's no forgiveness. There's no forgiveness of sins. And so what he was saying in his own way is, is that once you experience something, you experience something in Christ not available in these other religions in the same way. And that changes how you think and how you feel. And so I find I cannot have the same kind of conversations with non-believers that I can have with believers in Christ. Six, why did Paul say salvation by grace without any actions? I'm so glad you asked this question. <laughs> okay, he didn't say that exactly. For by grace are you saved through faith, and, not of, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Salvation is a gift from God without works. But the very next verse is, but we, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So it's about the order. That's the difference. See, all other religions work comes first. You have to work in order to get salvation. In Christianity, salvation comes first. And that enables you to be able to do good works. So we believe in good works. We just believe that the, the foundation for your salvation has to be the grace of God through faith. Any other foundation, such as a, a foundation of works, means you will rely on yourself and your own human ability. And that is a faulty foundation that will not be enough. And I think this is one reason why Buddhists, in, in my observation experience, really have no real hope. They have technical hope on paper, you know, on a piece of paper, there's hope. You know, with so many reincarnations, they can eventually get to nirvana. But if you talk to any Buddhist, how many of them think that they're ever going to reach nirvana? Yeah, go, go find out, tell me, if anybody thinks that anytime soon they're going to reach nirvana. And I think the answer is no. I don't think anybody has that. Virtually anybody, any Buddhist has real hope, at least in this Myanmar context.
Um, so that's so. Why did he say salvation by grace without any actions? Because he knows that if we trust in actions, we'll trust in ourselves, and if we trust in ourselves, we won't be able to receive God's gift. Seven, does Christocentric theology mean that God the Father and the Holy Spirit are inferior to Christ? Well, what do you think? Absolutely not. Okay, absolutely not. When we say that, Christ, that Paul's theology is Christocentric, it's that we're saying that, it's about Paul. Paul is holding up Christ so that he wants the whole world to see that we can understand who God is and how we may relate to God and have our salvation through this one man, God, being Jesus Christ. And so his theology is centered around Christ. But as I said before, it's really the Trinity that's in the center, not just Christ. God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit are all in that inner circle. You cannot say one is inferior to the other. In fact, if anybody is inferior, Jesus is inferior to God the Father. That's called subordinationist theology. That was rejected by the church. But there were some people who believed that. So a proper understanding of Paul's theology is there's a relationship between the three members of the Trinity. It's not hierarchical, but they have different roles. Um, so I think that's the best way to try to understand it. How can we apply Paul's idea of reconciliation in the Myanmar context? Better watch the time. Sorry, 12. Um, let me take a few more minutes quickly. Uh, that one I'm going to wait because that's application. A few of these questions are about what we call hermeneutics or interpretation. And for these first few weeks, we're really focusing on what did Paul say in his context. And we'll talk more about application later. So I'm going to skip that one. Number nine, can the Holy Spirit work in lives of those who don't know the gospel? Yes, because the whole, God is everywhere in the world, and the gospel is not known everywhere. Where? But the question really should be, does the Holy Spirit bring people to salvation who don't know the gospel? Paul does not answer that question. He doesn't answer that question. Because his concern is with bringing the gospel message to people who don't know it. And so his assumption is that if they don't know it, they can't be saved. But he doesn't answer, answer the question, is the Holy Spirit at work out there in different ways? He doesn't answer that. But he does assume the gospel needs to go to people who don't know it. Does Paul believe Jesus' salvation for those who, no matter what religion, Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, uh, again, no, he does not. If he believed that, he wouldn't need to share the gospel with other religions. Why, why would he go to Rome and preach the gospel? Why would he be beaten? Why would he let himself be stoned and and uh, by, by Jewish people or by uh, the, the pagans. Why would he bring the gospel to anybody if he believed that other religions are saved? He wouldn't. So clearly he must have believed that, that these other religions do not have Christ. Now, in modern theological conversation, there's a whole discussion about that. And, and when we get to that towards the end of the semester, we talk about inclusivism, exclusivism. I will talk more about that because there is a way to think about how Christ is involved in other religions, even though they don't know. That's called inclusivism. So there are people who teach that. But you asked me, did Paul believe that? I don't think so. I don't think Paul had any idea of, of that modern theological idea. Um, I mean, I don't see anything in his writing that would make me believe that.
so that leads again to number 11. You all, many of you have the same question. Does Paul's Christocentric theology mean that all will be saved? Uh, I don't think so. Again, based on his writing, because he feels compelled to go out and share the gospel because people need to believe, have faith, in order to be saved. How can they have faith if they've never heard the message? And so that was the impetus for the, for the sharing of the gospel, was the belief that people need the gospel and they need to have faith to be saved. And they can only have faith if they hear the gospel. Uh, and so that's... Um, but again, that, that's a bigger discussion when we get to modern theology. But we're talking now, we're trying, we're trying to make sure you understand what Paul says. And I would say there's very, very little evidence in Paul that would, that would suggest everybody is saved. But there are a few verses that are worth looking at. What did Paul believe about Jesus' death and resurrection for Gentiles? Um, Jesus' death and resurrection is for the world. He died for the world. He was resurrected for the world. But what that means is that he provided salvation for those who put their faith in, his, in him. Can Paul's theology bring unity among Christian denominations or does it bring division? Well, Paul's theology has helped bring, was really the impetus for Martin Luther to fight with the Catholic Church. And they eventually expelled him from the Catholic Church. And that was the birth of Protestantism. But there was Martin Luther and John Calvin and Zwingli. You should study this in church history. Uh, and it was really Paul's theology that provoked a lot of, of division between the Catholic Church who taught that salvation is through the church. I think for these words you should look it up, look, the, look them up because it's, it's hard in a few words to try to explain them to you. Do we have to do what the Bible teaches if it does not fit our context? That's application again. So we're going to hold off on that. Does Paul believe in original sin? I don't really think so. So no, it's not part of the core. Not, not my, my interpretation. Uh, historically, the Catholic Church has said, yes, he does. Protestants have said, yes, he does believe in original sin. Today, that's questioned. Uh, it's, it's based on just a couple of passages. It's not very strong. Um, and then, why didn't Paul minister to Jews? Why didn't he accept traditional Jewish beliefs? Okay, they, these questions are a misunderstanding of what I said. So let me say it again. Paul did try to minister to the Jews. The Jews rejected him. All right? That's why he didn't minister. Not because he didn't want to. He wanted to. He loved his own people. He tried to minister to them. He tried to preach to them. But they rejected him. And he felt called to go to the Gentiles. Why didn't he accept, accept traditional Jewish beliefs? Um, he did. He did accept traditional beliefs. But he believed that Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of traditional Jewish beliefs. And so he theologized by adding Jesus and the Holy Spirit to what he would taught. And the new, the new result was a new, is, a new Israel, a church, and it was uh, a new understanding about what salvation meant and what a relationship with God meant. And it, it came to be called Christianity. Uh, but it wasn't that he rejected the Jewish beliefs. He believed that the Jewish people, by and large, rejected Christ. And so he had to go on and develop his theology. Okay? Those are quick answers to important questions. Uh, before Wednesday, please uh, read the lecture notes ahead of time, because that will help you prepare for the class uh, to understand more. All right, so receive now the benediction. Now may the God of grace and love and righteousness and justice who sent his son into the world to show us what he's like, to die for our sins and to bring us into a right relationship with God. May this God who loves you and saves you and calls you to be his very own children. May this God draw you close this week, closer, that you may not only know the gospel better,
but that you may experience the power of the gospel in life-changing ways. Amen.